Good morning. Happy Sabbath to all of you. <laughs> We're delighted to be with you again this beautiful Sabbath morning. Um, it, it turned out to be a late Friday night for us because when we got home, I started getting missionaries calling me from all over the world. And I, I stayed up almost till midnight and uh, dealing with a few important issues. But, but fortunately, fortunately, we're from South America and we can begin a few minutes late. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's our fault. Um, I, I thought I would begin each presentation or some, most of our presentations this morning with a short mission story because we're from the mission field and we want to hear what is happening. Uh, other parts of the world are very different than, uh, than we're used to living here in Denmark. And uh, when, we, uh, when we hear what other things, what ha things are happening on other parts of the world, it gives us an illustration what, what it's like to be there. So I would like my wife to tell us a little, sto a little bit about the medical work. She's uh, in charge of the health clinic that we run there in Bolivia and uh, with the doctors and the dentists and the physical therapists. And so she works with the families and the children. So I would like to add, add, add Becky today just to tell us a short story before we begin. Okay, well, when we bought our property in Santa Cruz, Bolivia, we were originally we were <coughs> in the city and we had been praying that the Lord would help us to find a place out in the country, but close enough to where we could transmit to the city. And the Lord gave us a beautiful property. It used to be all cattle land. Um, but shortly after we moved on to the land, one of the owners sold his cattle, and he made his land into little lots. And it was just amazing. Within months, a little village had sprung up there. Well, it's not such a little village anymore. I, I calculate there's anywhere from 5,000 to 10,000 people because of all the children. And so we decided, why don't we start doing something medical? Because as we were walking around trying to get to know our, our neighbors, we found out a lot of them had medical problems. And in that little village, there was no medical help. And to have to go all the way to city was uh, quite an ordeal. And so we walked around, and we found a little place to rent, two rooms. And it, the Lord gave us a beautiful place. It was just practically smack in the middle of that little village. And um, so we started out doing medical care, but then I thought, you know, when the, the vacation time comes, why don't we do something for the children? And so we started out. We started out with about 30 kids, and by the end of the week, we had 70. <laughs> and so we've been doing uh, vacation Bible schools twice a year. Uh, once during the summer vacation, and then once right in the, the middle of the school year. They have two weeks. And what's really been encouraging to me is to see how the kids have just really responded. And when we finished the vacation Bible school, they liked it so much, they said, can't we continue? So we decided that every Saturday afternoon and every Wednesday night, we would also do something for the children. And what's been really exciting to me is to see that many of the parents have really uh, been interested as well. Uh, once we got our media center up, we started doing one Sabbath a month. The first Sabbath of every month, we have a special live programming in the media center. And many of those people are now coming every Sabbath to that. And um, some of them have actually been baptized. It was so thrilling to me when... Uh, some of them started eating vegetarian diets, and th that's one thing I always try to do in the vacation Bible school. I give them a little healthy snack so that they can learn to eat more vegetables and, and fruits. And the kids have really enjoyed that. We try to make it something fun, you know, like out of orange, we'll make a little, we cut it in slices and make it look like a little puppy dog or something, you know, and, and they have just really enjoyed that. And I have seen, we started the vacation Bible schools in the little village called Barrio Lindo, and uh, those kids have just really enjoyed eating that. This year we decided to expand into another little village that's five kilometers away called Pedro Lorenzo, and to see the reaction of the kids with the food. 
They yeah. weren't sure they wanted to. What's this green thing? It's broccoli. I never heard of broccoli before. <laughs> and to try to get them to eat it. And I see the difference with the other village. We have been doing it for six years, and they, they just gobble down that stuff now. So it, it's just encouraging to me to see how we can reach these villages through our children. And also, <coughs> after a few years in the one place we were renting, the owner, he had been working in Spain, and he has come back. So we, we left. But little by little, the Lord has been providing, and we hope that very, very soon, hopefully this year, we can start meeting in our new building that we're building. Where we still have to hook up the water and the electricity. Otherwise, we, can, we have a, enough structure to start with that. And uh, we're hoping it to be more like a wellness center. So just ask you all to keep us in prayers that this can be a light for this community. Thank you. Thank you, Becky. Thank you, Becky. It's, that's, our, that's our missionary nugget for today. Uh, I mean, for, the, for this uh, first service, uh, we like to keep, our, we like to keep um, our feet on the ground and to, and to work with the people in the villages where they are. We like to meet with them, go to their homes, become friends. As we walk through <coughs> this village, people say, hi, Uncle David, hello, Aunt Becky, and the little children. And so we're not there very often. We, can, we travel a lot. So we only sleep in our own bed about two days a month. So that gives you an idea. But, but as, we, as we travel, we realize uh, as we get older, we, we find it harder and harder to be constantly on the road. Uh, we like to exercise more regularly, but when you're traveling a lot, uh, you can't run to the city or run places you don't know. We like to run. We like to exercise. We like to eat certain things. You know, m Most of us, uh, as we get older, we realize that we be fall into certain habits and ways of doing things. My father-in-law is very German, and uh, Becky's father, and he eats exactly the same amount of nuts, the same types of nuts, the same type of food every day is exactly the same thing every day. <laughs> and and uh, we realize that we're becoming more that way too the older we get. We like to have the food that we like to eat exactly the same way every day. And when you're young, you just eat and sleep and do everything. I'm going to show you some pictures later today. Uh, once the sun stops shining over here and goes more this way, we'll, we'll project some pictures for you so you can see some of the things that, that we've been doing. But praise the Lord that young people are now coming to take over uh, much of the work. Uh, we have 300 uh, different missionaries. Some of them are older. Most of them are younger, and they're pilots and dentists and doctors and mechanics and teachers and agriculture and there's plenty of work uh, wherever you go there's plenty of work even at home here in Denmark you have plenty of work to do and uh, but sometimes it's good to do training overseas you know soldiers they don't train at home the government takes the soldiers and they train them away from home and so sometimes we need to be in another place to train then we can come home and do missionary work so this morning we're going to read about some things that Jesus did and the closer we work to the way that Jesus worked, the, the better will be the success. So we need to model everything we do after the way that Jesus worked. So we're going to look at some of those examples today, and you'll hear some more mission stories as well. Uh, shall we bow our heads before we begin, please? Heavenly Father, we ask your presence today as we begin this uh, uh, special service. Thank you for the Sabbath hours. Thank you for the promised blessing of accompanying us through the Holy Spirit where two or three are gathered together. You would be with us. We thank you that you promised to do that and we accept and we thank you that you have done it and that speak to our hearts, speak to our minds, prepare us to serve, teach us to serve and prepare us also for your soon coming. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. How many of you have had a chance to read the book Mission Pilot? Several of you. Most of you have not. You can get a free copy online. Uh, we don't have it in Danish, but you can pick 18 languages. Uh, English is probably the most common, but if it's, if it's German or if it's French or Spanish or uh, Russian, um, Korean, I don't see anybody that might be Korean here today. But uh, in any case, it's a book 
that will encourage you. It was written for young people. In Switzerland, there are several primary schools where the teachers are reading it to their children. Uh, and uh, and it's, it's an encouraging book because it, it teaches you to trust God more. It teaches you to, to uh, that even when you go through difficult times, it starts out, the first chapter is about my hijacking. When I was hijacked in Mexico, 25 years old, and then I was accused uh, uh, of 15 crimes against the state, and I was thrown in prison to stay there for 14 years. And it was very difficult for me. Um, my wife did not know what happened to me. She thought they had killed me because we've had friends that have been hijacked and they have been killed. And, and she did not know where I was. And so my wife and children are at home wondering what happened to daddy. And I'm in, I'm in a prison thinking of how can I communicate with my family, let them know where I am, and that I'm going to be here a very long time and they're going to have to come and move to this place to see me every once in a while. And uh, it was a difficult time and I remember arg arguing with God. Uh, Lord, I'm just 25 years old. This is my first general conference appointment. Uh, I've prepared, I've gone to school for a long time, uh, learning five different professions and trying to prepare for the mission field. And finally, I finished my studies and now I go to prison. And how, how do I understand this? And, and I argued with God about it. And the Lord impressed me that I needed to just obey his orders. And, and I said, well, what, what do you want me to do? I, I want you to offer your services uh, to the prison director. You're a registered nurse. They need medical care here. I want you to offer your services and then uh, uh, do whatever he asks you to do. But, but I'm depressed. I don't want to work for the people. I don't want to take care of patients. But that's what I want you to do. Yes, sir. We have to learn to obey our general. So I said, yes, sir, and I went to talk to the, to the guard, and he said, what do you want? And I said, I am Captain David Gates, because I always w went by the name Captain because I was a pilot. And, and I'm Captain David Gates, and the guard said, yes, sir. <laughs> and I was a prisoner, you know, and I, w I didn't expect him to salute me, but it, he said, yes, sir, Captain. And, and I said, I need to speak with the director. So he, he called the prison director, and he said, the captain, sir, want to talk to you. Don't salute a prisoner. Uh, and he, but he said he was a captain. He's a pilot captain. He's not a military captain. And, and so, oh, oh, so the guard said, okay, you can go talk to him. So I told him that I was a nurse. And, uh, and he said, oh, we have plenty of needs for doctors here. I said, I'm not a doctor. That's okay. You are a doctor now. I said, but I didn't study to be a doctor. I studied to be a nurse. And he said, as far as we're concerned, you're the prison doctor now. <clears throat> I'm going to give you an office. And I thought, oh, what have I gotten myself into? And he gave me an office that only had a little table, a little chair, and a big book, and one stethoscope, so you could listen to their lungs and their abdomen. So I said, do you have any medicines? No. Do you have any medical books? No. Well, how am I supposed to treat the patients? That's up to you. So. He made an announcement. We now have a prison doctor. He's going to be seeing 50 patients a day. Ah, Lord, what have you done to me? And, and so I started seeing the patients. The first patient came in. Good morning, doctor. Good morning. Uh, what is your problem? So I got the book. I wrote his name in, uh, the date, what his complaints were. I listened to his lungs, listened to his abdomen. He said, I have this problem. Now, what can you do for me, doctor? Well, the, the room was bare. There's nothing I can do. Oh, yes, there are eight natural remedies you have to do. You have to learn to pray more. I'll pray with you. I'll teach you how to pray. Then you have to do more exercise. You need to walk out, outside uh, of the cell. Uh, during the daytime, they're allowed to walk, and you can do more exercise. You need to drink more water. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I gave him all eight natural remedies. And, and then... Uh, you need to learn to trust in God more. And, and when I told him all of that, he said, thank you, doctor. Thank you. I will do that. And he left. The next person came in. I did the same thing. This time he had an eye problem. And I wrote it down. And he said, what do I do? There are eight natural remedies you need to do. <laughs> and then all 50 patients got the same treatment. Uh, all of them. But, but after several days, I realized there were some issues that were very serious. I found two patients with appendicitis. 
and they needed surgery. And walking around wasn't going to help them too much. They were running a fever. They were very sensitive uh, uh, to rebound pain, which is as you let go, you press in, you let go. Oh, it hurts a lot. That's one of the symptoms of appendicitis. I wrote it down, and I t went to the prison director, and I said, I'm sorry, but this here you need a surgeon. You have to have a surgeon that can operate immediately. He says, but we don't have any, any surgeons. We don't have anybody who's willing to operate. And then I remembered I was the hospital administrator. And so, and so I said, well, I'm willing. I'm willing to call the hospital, and I'm sure a surgeon will come and do the operation for free. He said, there is the phone. You can call the hospital. Now, up to that time, my wife did not know where I was. And I had not been able to talk to anybody. But when I called on the phone, I called to the nearest phone. The hospital didn't have a phone because we were out in the country at that time. Today they have a phone, but they didn't have a phone in that, at that date. So I called the nearest neighbor in, in the city, and I started to talk to him. He said, Capitan, are you still alive? And, I, and, and just then there was a knock at the door, and he went to open the door, and it was my wife who had driven five miles to town to use the phone to tell my parents that probably I was dead. And I was on the phone at the very time. I really thank the Lord how he coordinated our contact. And she was so delighted to hear from me. I was so happy to hear from her. And I told her where I was and what was happening. Please send the surgeon right away with surgical packs. He needs to go to the hospital and he needs to do surgery. So the, 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 our surgeon came, he did the surgeries, he saved the lives of the two patients, and then he left. And I was there looking through the bars going, goodbye. <laughs> I thought I was going to be there for 14 years. But you know, when we do God's will, God, God uh, also was able to do a special miracle because the prison director was watching us. And after two or three days of working, he said, I've been watching you, and you, you too, because I had a passenger with me. The director of education for the conference was with me. And uh, he said, you two are not, are not criminals. You do not deserve to be here. I'm very happy you're here because we have medical care. But, but I, I know that you are not guilty. So he said, I have gone to the government. I have threatened them with exposing their corruption. And they have agreed to drop the charges. Go bring your clothes. You're going home. What a wonderful thing. If I had not done the medical work that God asked me, maybe we would have been there for 14 years. But, but um, the, because of the work that we did in the medical field, we were able to go home after 10 days. And we were so grateful for God. So when God asks you to do something difficult or something that you don't feel like you feel like doing, just to obey God. It will be a blessing for you. God is always looking for excuses to bless us, but it always comes through obedience. Obedience is the key that will allow us to, to uh, receive God's blessing. So let us remember that. God doesn't ask for obedience in order just to force us. He asks for obedience in order to bless us. So I just wanted to share that story with you this morning, uh, uh, that obedience is the key to God's blessing. It's not a slavery it's, we have free will. We can obey or not obey. It's up to us. But if you choose to obey, it will come with a big blessing. And that is what the whole world is facing today. The whole world is facing the decision whether to obey or not to obey God. We're facing that in our families. We're facing that in the churches. We're facing that in society. Do we obey God or do we disobey? The more we rebel against God, the more we suffer in society. And the more we obey God in our families and individually, the more we, we have God's blessing. You know, I, I know we all want God's blessing. I would like to invite you to open your Bibles to Matthew 17. We're going we're gonna to read about, we're gonna read about a, special, a special event that teaches us some lessons, uh, teaches us some lessons about how God works and what he expects of us in our work that we do. Matthew 17, we'll begin reading uh, in verse 10. Here we have an example um, talking about that Jesus had just, just been transfigured. Uh, I was in Israel a year and a half ago, 
and we went to the mountain of transfiguration where it is believed that Jesus uh, was transfigured where Elijah and Moses came down to be with Jesus. And they had just come off the mountain and uh, they had just seen this. And as they were coming down in verse 10, Matthew 17, 10, his disciples asked him saying, uh, why then say the scribes that Elijah must come, Elias? And Jesus said, Elijah truly shall come first and restore all things. But I say unto you that he already came. Elias came already and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatever they listed. Likewise shall the Son of Man suffer. And then the disciples understood that he spoke about John the Baptist. There is an Elijah message. It's not the person Elijah. It's the message of Elijah that Jesus was referring to. John the Baptist came to prepare the way for Jesus' first coming. There's going to be three Elijahs. And we will be discussing those three Elijahs. The first Elijah was the physical Elijah. The second Elijah was John the Baptist. And Malachi says that the Elijah message, before the end, before the coming of the Lord, the last day of the Lord, there will be another Elijah message. We have to understand the Elijah message. Because the Elijah message is what prepares the way for Jesus' coming. It prepares the hearts of the people. It brings repentance. It brings reformation. And it brings a change in behavior in the way that we think, in the way that we act. And something has to happen in the world before Jesus can come. And that is our job, not only to receive the message, but to share it with others. That is our task. That is our mission. That is why we were born, to be able to prepare a world for Jesus' coming. Uh, John the Baptist prepared the world for Jesus' first coming. And it's the last generation that's going to prepare the world for Jesus' second coming. And we are living in that time period that immediately precedes Jesus' second coming. So we must learn, we must understand uh, this message. Now, the, the message to this morning is entitled Total Possession. There's going to be only two groups of people in the world when Jesus comes. And both groups are going to be totally possessed. One group is going to be possessed and controlled by the Holy Spirit. And another group is going to be possessed by demonic spirits. Now, demonic spirits have never possessed the whole world before. We've never seen that. Have any, has anybody here ever seen a demon possession? Let me see your hand if you have. There's two. Three, okay. Uh, four. Uh, it's not a very pretty sight. Because when, when the demons possess a human body, they, the person suffers very much. Sometimes they choke them. Sometimes they throw them on the ground. Sometimes, uh, sometimes they're, they're beaten. Sometimes they, they, but they don't have any control of their own. When the Holy Spirit possesses you, you are always in control. The Holy Spirit never takes away your power of choice. The Holy Spirit never forces people. It's a voluntary choice that we have to be possessed of God. It's a beautiful thing to be possessed of God because it brings you freedom. You're always able to choose for yourself. When Satan possesses, he's a dictator. He forces people. He hurts them. He threatens them. He, he causes them to suffer. But the whole world is going to be possessed at the, in the end of time as you make your decisions. And you know, today, uh, it doesn't... Before, uh, in the past, you could make a lot of wrong decisions before suffering the consequences. Today, it's getting more and more narrow. Sometimes... One choice will allow you to be, to suffer the consequences of Satan. We are living at a time, when there's not a lot of time to, to spend a lifetime trying to decide. Your life or death depends on your choices today. And Jesus is talking about that time. But then as the disciples came down with Jesus, talking about Elijah, uh, in verse 14, it says, And when they were come down to the multitude, there came... They came to him a certain man, kneeling down, saying, Lord, have mercy on my son. He is a lunatic. And he was sore vexed, for oftentimes he had fallen into the fire and into the water. And, and I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Now, God had given the disciples power over 
evil spirits. They had gone out and they came back and they said, even the spirits are subject to us. They were rejoicing from their missionary journey. They realized they had divine power given to them by God. But here the disciples tried and they couldn't do anything. And Jesus answered in verse 17 and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil and he departed out of him and a child was cured from that very hour. But the disciples didn't know what to say. They came to him <coughs> privately and they said, why were we not able to cast him out? And Jesus said, because of your unbelief. Let me ask you, do we live in an age of unbelief today? All around us, we have people that do not believe. In fact, the number is increasing. The number of people who do not believe is increasing. But even inside the church, sometimes belief is increasing. increasing. And, and in our families, why is there such an attack on our belief? Why are we, why are we subject to so many temptations to lose our faith? We, we are subject, every one of us, to losing our faith and to becoming weak and to falling into sin. And we ask ourselves, why is it so difficult to believe? Why is it so difficult to obey? Why is it so difficult to do the right thing today? It's because we're living in the very, very last generation when it's life or death and the devil is fighting for his life. It's not only life or death for us, it's life or death for Satan. <clears throat> because if he can prevent God's people from totally surrendering to God, Jesus cannot come yet. Now, there is a limit to God's mercy. There was a limit at the flood. For 120 years, Noah was preaching an invitation of mercy. But there came a day when the invitations ceased. There came a day when there was no more invitations. Now, Right before the door was closed, what was the last sign that God gave to that generation? Can you remember what happened? What came marching into the ark? The animals. The animals were the last evidence that this was a divine event. All of the animals, the lions and the tigers, the giraffes, all the land animals, elephants, little animals, big animals, they all came marching in orderly out of the forest and they marched right into the ark and they went into their cages inside the ark and Noah shut them up and the people were saying, what is going on? We have never seen such a thing. Could it be today that, that God will give us evidences again? Now, do you think Noah had uncles and aunts? Do you think he did? Most probably. Do you think he had nieces and nephews? We don't know if he had brothers and sisters but he probably had family that was outside the ark. And you would imagine that they would have come in, at least his uncles and his aunts. Maybe people lived so long, maybe he had parents. Probably had parents alive. What about grandparents? Well, when you lived nearly 800, 900 years, you usually saw many generations. You would see your great, 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 great grandparents. Uh, how many of you remember your grandparents? Okay, most of us have lived with good health care and we can... How many of you remember great-grandparents? You do? A couple? Okay, not as many. Can anybody remember their great-great-grandparents? That's a little more difficult, isn't it? A hundred years is just not enough. But if you lived several hundred years, you could definitely see that many generations. Well, think of, think of uh, Noah. Noah had family, undoubtedly. Parents, grandparents, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, ne nephews, and nieces. None of them went into the ark. It must have been very difficult to make the last appeal. And then God said, stand back. And then all of the animals went into the ark. And then the, the scientists didn't know what to say. The people turned to the scientists and said, maybe Noah's right. Look at the animals. They're obeying. The animals went into the ark. What about us? 
No, we will explain it to you. Don't worry. Do not be alarmed. We will give you an explanation. And the people said, we prefer to believe our scientists. They don't know what's happening, but maybe they will tell us by tomorrow. Well, after that was done, one last appeal. And the angel said, go into the ark. And Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives went into the ark. And the door was closed. Could it be open after that? Once the God closes the door, no man can open it. And when God opens the door, no man can close it. Is the door open today? Yes. Are you able to walk through the door today? Yes. Will there come a time in the near future when the door will close? We learned last night from the ten virgins. The, the parable of the ten virgins in Matthew 25, we learned last night that there will be an event in the near future. And that event in the near future will mean that the church will wake up, the ten virgins will wake up, which represents the, those that are waiting for Jesus' coming, and they will seek to prepare. Some have prepared already. They have oil in their lamps. The Holy Spirit has already been doing its work on their hearts. And some do not have oil. That means they have been careless. They have been worried about building their houses, building their business, living life, uh, just going to church on, on, the, on Sabbath, and then forgetting all about God's work the rest of the week and building, taking care of their own work. They have been careless spiritually. They have not been asking God to reform their hearts and cleanse their hearts from worldliness. They have just been living a normal life and thinking that the church is just a club. And I am a club member. Therefore, when suddenly the event happens and they realize, now Jesus is coming, I am now convinced. It is time to prepare. We learned last night that while they went to prepare and to find oil, those that were ready went into the marriage feast. And what happened to the door? The door was closed. And when they tried to get in, what did they hear? I know you not. This is, this is probably one of the saddest verses in Scripture. People who have been waiting for Jesus' coming suddenly find they cannot go in any longer. You see, the closed door is what happened in the ark. Once that door closed, it didn't matter if you wanted to or didn't want to, you believed or didn't believe, there was no getting in. But the next day was a normal day, and the following day was a normal day. Three or four days went by, and they were normal days. And uh, almost a week went by, six days, and it was a normal day. And they began to relax. <laughs> I was kind of scared when that door closed. I thought maybe something was going to happen, but I guess I can relax. I guess it doesn't matter anymore. Those are crazy people inside. But on the seventh day, or should I say, uh, after the week was over, then something happened. It wasn't the normal day anymore. Dark storm clouds, thunderings, earthquakes, the, the ground began to break up. Water came pouring out of the ground. It started to rain. They had never seen rain before. It is calculated that most of the humidity in the air uh, and that we have today, the waters, was up in the air. It was a very thick, thick layer of humidity that covered the earth. And that, that allowed us to have, uh, some scientists have calculated that we lived in a hyperbaric chamber. Do you know what a hyperbaric chamber is? It's a chamber that is high, pressure, high compression. Many people that have cancer, they take hyperbaric treatment. They put them in a chamber and they increase the pressure and the oxygen that we have in the air penetrates much more efficiently into our cells when you live in, in a high pressure <laughs> chamber. Like when you go up on the top of a mountain. When you go to the top of a mountain, <sighs> you have trouble breathing, why? Your body is trying to get oxygen because the pressure is very low up there. But, but when you come down to sea level, like Denmark is at, is at sea level, uh, then you, you can breathe easily because there's more pressure. But imagine if the atmospheric pressure, by the way, what is the atmospheric pressure? Does anybody remember how much, what is the normal? Well, in, in millibars, we say one, one zero one three in aviation. In inches, it's 29.92 inches of mercury. 
Uh, but uh, one atmosphere is, uh, is basically 0 0.1.103 millibars. That's the normal pressure today. But it was estimated that it was three times, up to three times that much before the flood. So we all lived in a hyperbaric chamber where the atmospheric pressure made oxygen penetrate into our cells and people lived longer. With more oxygen, you have less disease because oxygen kills cancer cells. It kills uh, bacteria cells, uh, hyperpenetration. Did you know that I, I was in, we were um, in Texas recently and the doctor in charge of one of our wellness centers there, he said he's been doing research and they have discovered that it's not only oxygen, light kills bacteria. Now, you know you can put water in a, in a, clear, in a clear bottle and put it in the sun and the ultraviolet rays of the sun will, will kill the bacteria. The sun can, 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 can purify the water, but light has been found to kill cancer cells. And so some physicians, some surgeons, are actually putting light onto the tumor. They shine a little light in and shine light on the tumor, and the tumor reduces in size. It's interesting, huh? Are you children of the light or children of darkness? What are we? We're children of light, right? Light heals. Oxygen heals. Good breathing, more air. Exercise heals because it penetrates oxygen more into our muscles, into our body. So uh, when Noah went into the ark and the door was closed, it was not opened again even for seven days before it started to rain. And then when the rains came, it remained closed all the way through until God opened the door again. So we have, we have a similar situation here because of our unbelief. Unbelief actually fills the world today. People don't want to believe. People don't want to... Uh, well, they actually everybody believes something, right? Uh, the World Cup just finished. You think people, do you think most of the world believes in the World Cup? Do they spend a lot of time in front of the television? Do they spend a lot of money to go to the World Cup? A lot of people? Obviously, they believe in something. Warning. Everybody believes in something. If you're an atheist, you have to believe in something. You have to believe that there is no God. Uh, some months ago, I was traveling in, down to Bolivia in a, in a commercial flight. I was sitting next to a man from Europe, and he said he was an atheist. And I said, congratulations. You must have a lot of faith. A lot of faith? No, I'm a man that doesn't have any faith. On con Au contraire, we say in French. On the contrary, you have a lot of faith. Really? How, how is that? I said, look at that pretty girl over there sitting in that seat. Yes, you must have a lot of faith to believe that it's just an accident. I said, when you see a beautiful painting, a beautiful sculpture, you go, wow, what a Michelangelo must have designed that. But then you see a beautiful woman, and you think, there's no designer. Oh, please. I said, it takes a lot of faith to believe there's no design in something that's so beautiful. I said, look at my watch. And this is, it has a solar panel in it. I put it in the sun, and it charges. I've used it for years. I've never had to change batteries. And this is just an accident. Nobody designed it. It just came that way. No, he said, no, that can't happen. It took a lot of engineers to design it. And, you th and this watch can't even replicate itself. But that woman over there, when she gets married, they can have babies and have more beautiful women and beautiful men, uh, 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 handsome young men. I said, whoever heard of such design to say it's an accident? It could never happen. If a watch is not an accident, Something like that cannot be an accident. He goes, now you've caused me to doubt. Now I don't know what to do. What can I believe? I said, well, you've moved a step forward. You're now an agnostic. <laughs> an agnostic says, I don't know. At least you, you have improved. I said, now you, you, have, you have less faith in believing in the impossible, and now you're beginning to have faith in believing in the possible. For every beautiful thing, there is a designer. And I said, uh, anything you see that works 
and performs and it came with design. I'm a computer scientist. I said, I taught computer science for years in the university. And I can tell you that a software that is well done required much intelligent design to be able to function. You, you open your computer, the operating system. I said, required design. It doesn't happen accidentally. And yet, we take the DNA today, we take the DNA and we, uh, scientists today, the Pope, the Pope said last year that, uh, that it is a good thing to mix the genes of animals with the, animals, with the genes of men. I said, that causes chaos. How can you take a beautiful design machine and throw other code into it and expect it to be better? It doesn't get better, it gets worse. And no computer scientist would believe if you took the operating system for your phone and you took an operating system from another computer or something else and just threw it in there, what would happen? The phone would quit working. It would do crazy things. Weird, weird windows would happen and, and you'd push one button and another sound would come out and it would dial the wrong number. And maybe it wouldn't even dial at all. I said, anytime you put something random into a design, it gets worse. It doesn't get better. And, I, and so he, he had to admit. He had to admit that, yes, now he doubts the whole system of unbelief. But we live in a world of unbelief. But it's not because we don't have a religion. We do have a religion. It's called atheism. It's called agnosticism. We choose to worship uh, unbelief. Because normally, if you use your logic, you would understand that anything that is beautifully designed has a designer, right? Would that be normal? Yeah. A beautiful car? A beautiful building? Which, who of us would ever think that that was random? No, a beautiful building, a beautiful car, a beautiful piece of equipment took a lot of work to make it that way. And the world is filled with evidences of beautiful design. Even flowers. Intricate flowers. I still remember one flower. Uh, Psalms 103. Psalms 103 has, has a... Uh, a verse in it that, that reminds me of something interesting. It's a, it's a praise psalm. And, uh, and, and verse 18 says, no, um, verse 13 and, and, I'm sorry, 15 and 16, as for man, his days are as the grass, as the flower of the field, so he flourishes. The wind passes over it and it is gone and the place remembers it no more. And yet, I remember a little flower on the mountaintop of Venezuela. It was the only flower on the mountaintop. My wife and I walked to the top of the mountain where, I used to, where we used to live. We walked to the top of the mountain and we saw one little tiny beautiful blue flower. That was the only one there. And I still remember it and the wind passed over it and it is no more. And its place remembers it no more. But I remember it. That little flower impressed me with what God does. Just on top of a mountain, he just puts a beautiful little flower. Who can see it? Only a few people that go by to the mountaintop. But yet he takes the time to design a beautiful flower. Many of us can look back in our life and we can see beautiful moments in our life. Blessings of God. We also have difficult moments, which are part of the curse of sin. But if we continue to trust God, Jesus said here in Matthew 17 that because of unbelief, you cannot do the works that God asks you to do. He says, Verily I say unto you, verse 20, If you only have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say to that mountain, Remove hence, and it will remove yonder, and nothing shall be impossible for you. Um, do you think the church work in Denmark has been finished already, or is there still a work to do? Still a work to do? So why hasn't it been finished? Would it be because of our unbelief, maybe? If we truly believed, what if, what if Bill Gates, or, or is, there, is there a very famous rich person here in Denmark? Yes. Do you have a rich family in Denmark that everybody knows they're very, very wealthy? Yes. Is that the name of the family? Yes. Anyway, some of you are calling different names. Uh, so there's some wealthy families. No. There's very wealthy families. Well, in North America, everybody knows. In the world, they know Microsoft and Bill Gates. I talked to Bill Gates twice. 
He asked me if I was related. People should have said, yes, yes, I'm related. I'm your cousin. But, <laughs> but I asked him if he was from German or English heritage. He said he didn't know. I said, I'm from German background. And so he said, well, I don't know. I said, I can't tell you if we're related or not. But he wanted to know. But Bill Gates is known to be one of the wealthiest men in the world, even though behind the scenes there's men that are much, and women that are much more wealthier than Bill Gates. Publicly, he is a wealthy man. But behind the scenes, there's people that are hundreds of times more wealthier than Bill Gates. But let's just take Bill Gates for an example. If Bill Gates were to come here and he were to say, any money you spend on God's work, anything you spend, all you have to do is turn in the receipts, I will reimburse it to you. Okay, let's imaginary situation. If you want to do evangelism, if you want to buy books, if you want to do, if you want to uh, sponsor a television network, if you want to put programs on the air, if you want to do a health, sim, uh, a health uh, expo, and you want to open up a wellness center, you want to help people, you want to take care of cancer patients, anything you do, any cost, whatever it is, just let me know how much you spend, I will immediately give you back your money. Okay, you understand the situation. Now, would that encourage you to, to take, spend more money for God? If he told you, he'd give you back. And you spent, if you spent uh, 10,000 kroner, and immediately he gave you a check for 10,000. Would you be more willing to spend? Probably, right? You would say, well, if he's going to pay me back everything, well, I'm going to do something. And you spend money, and boom, you go to his office, and you turn in your receipts, gives you your money back. Well, I think I'm going to buy, uh, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a wellness center, boom, and you get your money back. And it doesn't matter what it is you spend, Bill pays you back. Okay, that would encourage you to spend more money for God and you would, do, you would do more work because you would immediately get your money back. But you know what? That's exactly what God does. It says, give and it shall be given unto you. Isn't that God's promise? So do we believe God's promise or don't we believe God's promise? No, we don't. Because if we believe God's promise, we would put more of our time and more of our resources into God's work. Do you agree with my reasoning? Does the Bible say, given it shall be given unto you? Mm -hmm. um, in Luke 7, God made those promises. And he, men shall give them, it says, overflowing, they shall give into your bosom. In other words, they will give you more. I remember the first time I came face to face with that a decision. My wife and I, my wife and I had uh, made the decision after teaching at, at the university for some years in, in, the, in the Caribbean, in Trinidad. We decided to spend a year in the jungles of Guyana with our five children and just to volunteer our time. We didn't expect a lot. We expect the least we would need is some food. The Indians would give us a place to stay, but we needed food to eat. And I wasn't sure how we would get enough food. So I kept $300, US dollars, I kept them. And as an emergency, in case we had a health problem, a snake would bite us, we got malaria, or if we had to buy food. That was my last money that we had. And we said, just in case, I'll keep $300. So we went into the jungles. We paid for the airplane. They dropped us off there. And we started working in the jungles with the Indians. Well, the very most urgent need we saw was health care. People had malaria. There was some snake bites. They needed care. One, one couple, uh, an older couple, they got malaria. And the, the, the local villagers carried them for two days in a hammock. Sometimes they had to pull them up a cliff with ropes, the hammocks. They finally were almost to our village and the man died, the husband. But the, 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 the wife made it. She arrived. They buried the, the husband along the way. That was, must have been a very sad situation to lose your husband as you're, as you're traveling to get help. But they brought the wife and they turned to me and they said, uh, Elder Gates, please heal this lady. Well, I, I knew that I could pray for her, but I also knew that if she had malaria, I could, I could get, buy some medication for her. I knew as a nurse, I'm a registered professional nurse, I knew that I could get make medication for malaria, but we didn't have any. The only way I could get one was to call on the radio, have an airplane bring it over, but that would cost me $300. And the Lord reminded me, you have $300 hidden away. Oh, no, Lord, don't touch my money. 
That's my last money that I have. And if you touch that, I won't have anything for my family. And, and the Holy Spirit said, but you didn't come here to learn how to depend on yourself. You came here to learn how to depend on me. So use that money to save the lady's life. But Lord, don't I have the right to at least have a little savings? You didn't come here to depend on yourself. You came here to learn how to depend on me. Use the money and save the lady's life. Yes, sir. So I called the airplane. They brought me the medicine. I gave the medicine to the lady. She recovered and she went home. But I was still angry with the Lord. <laughs> what kind of God is that? That just takes away everything you have. Isn't it? It's not fair. At least I could keep a little bit for myself. And for two weeks I was just upset. And then one day an airplane came. I said, oh look, there was no scheduled flights for today. I wonder who's coming. So I went up to the runway and this white American lady came out of the airplane. We weren't expecting any visitors. So I said, what are you doing here? She said, I didn't know there was anybody here. What are you doing here? She said, my, dad, my father was a physician when I was a little girl, and we used to come to this village. And now I live, I live in Alaska, and I just came to visit. And, and, and I just came to visit, and I just didn't know you were here. So I said, would you like to stay in our little house? So she came and joined us for two weeks after she helped my wife in the clinic. And when she left to go home, um, as I took her suitcases up to the runway, she turned to me and said, David, do you accept donations? Um, um, Lord, do I accept donations? And the Lord said, I, you didn't ask her for anything. If she wants to give you the money, accept it. So I said, I guess we do accept donations. So she gave me an envelope. The plane landed and she left. Waved goodbye and I said, thank you very much. Well, I knew what was in the envelope, $300. And I didn't want to open it. And the Holy Spirit said, open it. I said, I don't need to open it. I already know what's inside. You already taught me a lesson. Given it shall be given unto you. And so I'm sure that she put $300 in there. You're just giving me back the money that we spent. And the Holy Spirit said, count it. But why do I need to count it? Count it! Ah, okay. So I pulled out the envelope, and I 100, 200, 300, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. One thousand seven hundred dollars. Lord, I am so humbled. I gave three hundred dollars, and some lady came all the way from Alaska, and brought one thousand seven hundred dollars. I said, "Well, that's what I promised." Given, it shall be given unto you. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I know, Lord, but I didn't really believe it would happen out here in the jungles. I just couldn't, I just couldn't imagine somebody coming from so far away and bringing cash without even knowing we were here. But the Lord said, now put that money into my work. So immediately we got some more. We went to, I went to town. I brought in some more supplies for the clinic. We started thinking of a school, building a school. There was no school, no secondary school anywhere for 300 miles. So we started building a school. It cost, it cost about uh, $20,000 to build a big school building. But we started and with the $1,700. And then soon after, a $10,000 donation came in. You know how it came in? When I was 15 years old, 16 years old, I used to mow the lawn and clean the house for a, a lady. And her son had died in the Second World War. His name was David as well. And so she always kept telling me about her son David, about her son David. I'm so glad, David, that you work for me, she said. And that was years ago. And now I'm, now I'm about 40 years old, over 40. I'm living in the jungles of Guyana. And she gets a dream. In the dream, the angel told her, find David Gates and give him 
Well, she didn't know where I was. She hadn't seen me for, for nearly over 20 years. How do I find David Gates? So she looked in the, in the telephone book and she found a Richard Gates. And so she called a Richard Gates and said, do you by any chance know anybody called David Gates? Yes, he's my son. Well, where is he? He's down, he's down in Guyana with his family working. Well, I want to give you $10,000 for you to give to him. So my dad calls, my dad, well, he couldn't call me there in the jungles, but he sent a, an email, and when I got to town, I, I got my emails, and I saw that somebody had given me $10,000. I said, now we can keep on building the school. And so the Lord was teaching us a lesson. If we believe, if we go forward, and we put our time and our money in God's work, God will keep it going. So you see, the, the main problem is unbelief, isn't it? That's our main problem. We don't believe very much, and so we risk very little. God would like to do great things for us, but we're not willing to risk it. It takes a decision to take a risk. And that means when you give of what you don't think you can afford, you're afraid you might lose something. There's two types of philosophies. There's a philosophy that if I give, God will give me back. And there's a philosophy that if I don't give, I won't get anything. And they're both right, by the way. If you don't give, you won't get anything. But if you give, that one is also right. He that gives will also receive. So today, this morning, uh, the, main, the main purpose of our understanding is to be totally controlled by God. And when God gives us an impression, a conviction that we should do something, if we do it, it is for our own blessing. Just like I was in prison. And I didn't want to take care of patients. But I did it. And 10 days later, I was able to go home. What if I would have said, no, Lord, I don't want to help people. I'm depressed. I might have been there for 14 years. But I said, Lord, I don't feel like it, but I'll, I will obey. And the blessing came to me. And if we believe and if we obey, God will pour out his blessing. But we need to have, be under God's total control. We, need to, we will be someday either possessed totally by the Holy Spirit or we will be possessed totally by the enemy, by demons. Today, the world is not that way. You can go out right now and you can see, see atheist people everywhere, and many of them are very nice people, right? They stop the car, they tell you, please, well, first they hold the door open for you so you can walk through, and you think to yourself, these are very nice people, and they don't believe in God, maybe. But that's not the way it's going to end. In the end, there's going to be total possession on one side or the other. You have to choose who's going to possess you. Demons or the Holy Spirit. And your choices today will determine what side you're on and who will possess you. If you want to have freedom, if you want to have happiness, if you want to have joy, you choose to be possessed by the Holy Spirit. But we have to start now. If you want oil in your lamps, you have to start feeding your mind on God's Word, asking the Holy Spirit to take out worldliness out of your life. And those who love the world cannot love God. The love of the world we all have. Do some of us really love our houses? Do some of us love our properties? Do some of us love our things? Many times we have a lot of love for things. Love of money? You say, but I don't have a lot of money. Oh, you don't have to have a lot of money to love it. Poor people can love money too. Poor people can love little things. Did you know that I can love my wife more than I love God? That's idolatry. To love your family more than you love God is idolatry because God deserves our supreme love and you know as we go closer to God my wife grows closer to God I grow closer to God we grow closer to each other you really want to love your wife love God first because if you if she knows that you love God first she can rest assured that she will be treated with love and if my spouse loves God first I can be assured that I will always have my wife. Because if her loyalty to God is so great, I know that her, her love for me will be great. You understand, right? Why do we have so many divorces at, in, 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 in the church? 
Why do we have so many problems in the church? Because we don't love God. Because if we love God supremely, we would draw closer to each other. Of course, it takes two sides to have a marriage. <laughs> you can love God. Maybe your spouse doesn't love God, or maybe it's the other way around. But if you put God number one in your family, number one above your family, above your house, above anything else, whatever God says, you say, yes, sir. Give me the power to do it. I will obey. If you do that, your family is secure. The church is secure. And we all will be happier and joyful. How many, how many people want to join a church where everybody is? Come join my church, please. I want you to join my church. Please come and enjoy life like I do. Is that the kind of church you want to be part of? No. But if you have a joyful church, a happy church, a, a church where the Holy Spirit dwells, where people are nice to each other, where you share together, where you work for the community, where you're, where you're loving. and Oh, people will want to be part of congregations like that. And that's what God is hoping to do. He wants his people to be joyful, full of love, full of happiness, so that other people will be attracted. The world is full of darkness. I was, in, I was broadcasting television in Bolivia, and we didn't have anything. We were the first Spanish television network the church had. We started broadcasting, and we didn't have anything. And so finally, some friends of mine said, well, I'll, we will give you moments of peace. Have anybody of you seen moments of peace on the internet? Type in David Gates moments of peace. And you will find beautiful nature videos with beautiful sacred music that I, I record uh, from around the world. And also friends of mine have given me footage and, and, I, and I put it together and uh, I make beautiful music and we put it on the air. Well, some friends of mine had made moments of peace and they put it on the air and we broadcast it, I mean, and then, but we didn't have nothing else to broadcast, so we just put that on the air. Like for months, all we had was nature videos with music. We didn't have very much. But then we started getting phone calls. One psychiatrist called me, and he said, we discovered that your television channel heals all depression. So we psychiatrists, we, we tell our patients, if you have depression, you can only watch channel 24. And all of them are healed. We do group therapy. We get everybody together and we turn on channel 24 and we watch nature videos with sacred music. And it brings a light and a healing into our hospital, psychiatric hospital. And then the, the ambassador from Germany called me. Here's a German man. And the ambassador said, we just want to thank you, me and my family, for your television network. We do not believe in God. We are atheists. But we watch Channel 24 all day long. Because if we turn it off, a darkness comes into our home. But when we leave it on, the music brings a light and a joy into our home. And so we listen to everything, the sermons, the cooking, the family life. We listen to everything. But it's mainly the music that fills our home with joy. So whatever type of music you listen to, that's the kind of spirit you have in your home. Remember little David? David would come into Saul's court. Saul was possessed by evil spirits and David would begin to sing psalms and as soon as he started singing, the, the demons would leave. The demons had a right to be there. They just don't want to be there. So when you have sacred music, now what about if, do you, you, you think King David brought in a rock band? Do you think King David walked in and is that what he did for Saul? I'm just asking some theoretical questions. Rock music doesn't bring the Holy Spirit. Rock music is for worldly entertainment. If you want the evil spirits to leave your home, you need to have truly sacred worship music in your home. If you have a trouble with depression, if you have a trouble with darkness, if you have a trouble with sadness in your home, if you have a trouble with temptation in your home, try putting on moments of peace. Just do download them off the internet or watch them on the internet. And just, just play, them, play beautiful sacred music in your home and you will watch how the light will turn on in your home. I hope that's an encouragement to you. Many people will watch this video later, and many of them will try, and they will be encouraged. Satan cannot stand to be in the presence of truly sacred music. So the choice is ours, to be possessed of God or to be possessed of demons. And I choose God. How about you? Are you willing for God today to take total possession? Amen. Would you join me? 
on our knees as we close in prayer, please. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you for the biblical illustrations and the stories of true life mission work that demonstrate your faithfulness. Please forgive us for not having enough faith. Please help us to have more faith in you. And as we, as we exercise our faith and as we follow your leading, we will learn valuable principles that will allow you to have total control of us, to surround us, to protect us, to provide for us. We need to learn those lessons. The day is coming when we have to have oil in our lamps. We have to learn to depend on you, but we can only do that if we have experiences with you. So thank you for showing us these illustrations and teaching us these principles so that we can also experience total dependence on you and total possession by the Holy Spirit. We want that. We still have many things for you to change. Please come into our hearts and change, take away from us all those worldly habits, those customs, and help us to t love and to depend on you and to read your word and to follow it. Give us power to follow and to be obedient children. And help us to share this joy and happiness with others that are around us. We pray and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>